The roundtable will be moderated by Alfredo Pascual. He's from Uruguay and is living in Germany. With his experience as a journalist, he also accepted PTMC's invitation to moderate the next roundtable called The Challenges of Cannabis Legislation. So please welcome and give a round of applause to moderator Alfredo Pascual. Thank you. Thanks. On the way here, I was reading the new bill that was presented or will be presented in the parliament here in Portugal to legalize recreational cannabis or adult use cannabis. In Germany, of course, there's also a big discussion going on at the moment. Uh, there's a clear intention from, from the government to legalize. But I always say that this is not a done deal until sales actually start. And we are still far from that in both countries. But to talk about these issues, I'm very happy to have a panel of experts here that I will ask them to come join me here on stage. And I'll start with Ricardo Rocha. Uh, he's a lawyer from PLMG. J, J? I hope that pronounced it correctly. So Ricardo, please come here. Then from Germany, I have Kai Friedrich Niermann from KFN Plus, uh, or Plus, if I say it in German. Uh, so Kai, please come here. Let's speak about Germany. And then I'm also happy to have here with me Georgie, George, Georgie, George, Teixeira. Uh, political advisor of Iniciativa Liberal. Okay, so again, it's not a done deal until sales start. If it were easy, then it would have been legalized already. Uh, there's a reason why that hasn't happened in Portugal and in Germany. But now it looks like we are finally going to do it uh, in both countries. But um, let's, talk, let's try to focus this conversation on what still needs to happen for that to be a reality. And to have a very, uh, very dynamic conversation, I will start with an open question for each one of you. Uh, in terms of what do you think is the single biggest challenge specific to Portugal or specific to Germany? Uh, why cannabis still has not been legalized or what still needs to happen for it to happen. Um, so let's start with you. With me. Yeah, <laughs> you're closer. Oh, okay, so thank you for the invitation. Thank you to Lauren, thank you to PTMC. Well, I think it's, it's, to, it's, it's hard to, to appoint one. Uh, let's challenge. start with one. Then <laughs> yeah, then yeah, there no, there no, will be more later. It's but really hard. Pick one. But uh, it's 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 hard. It's hard to it's hard to identify one one challenge to 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 overpass before the cannabis uh, recreational cannabis is legalized. Yeah. But uh, we're talking about adult use only. Yeah. Unless adult use. Okay. Un unless specified otherwise, we're yeah, talking yeah, about adult use. Okay. Medical is already legal in both countries. But I think there are there are some issues, and uh, the first one is is the of course the stigma there's that we still have about about cannabis and okay that's a good one so with stigma you think that there's still there still may not be enough support from the general population or not now i think the the situation changed a lot in the last years i think okay. now we we are ready to have a, a wide ranging debate on, on okay so stigma has been the main thing you think has yeah, been think a hurdle in general yeah, yeah. but that's getting better okay yes kai in germany yeah the same in germany uh, but um there was a grassroots movement in Germany. Uh, uh, the uh, different association, German Hemp Association, patient organizations, and there was this lawsuit 2015, uh, where the patient uh, won his case against the Federal Republic of Germany and was allowed to home grow medical cannabis uh, on his balcony. Uh, the German government didn't like that idea that um, medical pa cannabis patients uh, are allowed to grow their home home grow uh, on their balconies. So they introduced a formal law in 2017. And from that on, from 2017 on, the uh, s uh, stigma uh, vanished uh, slowly but, but steadily. Um, and uh, 2017 uh, happened one more thing. Um, we have the Green Party in Germany, which is a very um, strong party, uh, always have been strong in the polls. 
um, and um, they uh, introduced a Cannabis Control Act, a draft of a, of a Cannabis Control Act in 2017 for the first time. It was dismissed in Bundestag, uh, but um, after the last federal elections uh, in Germany 2017, uh, the Green Party negotiated um, together with the Conservatives and the Federals, uh, the, uh, the Liberal Party, um, um, they negotiated a, a coalition. And the Cannabis Control Act was on the table by that time in 2017. Kai, just to be clear, when you say conservatives, you meant social democrats, right? No, no, the social democrats okay, are the social democrats, the uh, <laughs> conservatives are the CDU, the union. Th that's the what I mean, okay. Yeah, okay. So, and uh, as this uh, Cannabis Control Act was on the table already in 2017, I, I said, okay, let's, and then the Grand Coalition came, the, this project failed, uh, we will have legalization within the next four years, uh, because uh, the, the ideas are valid, the ideas are correct, the, the, the change has to come, and now we are in the position that we are really uh, negotiating cannabis reform in Germany. So then summarizing, two things happened in Germany. One was uh, medical cannabis kind of removing or uh, easing the, the stigma around cannabis, and the second one was a political change to have a government in place that actually wants to do it. Yeah, a strong party um, 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 promoting a cannabis reform and the grassroots grass movement and all together led to this change. Biggest challenge in Portugal? Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you for the invitation for, for being here. Um, and so um, in Portugal, uh, so I will give you perhaps an, an interesting answer, uh, but the biggest challenge is probably political will. And I will actually disagree, or disagree with R Ricardo um, a bit uh, because in, at least from all the surveys we know, we've known for the last five years, or even more than the last five years, the majority of the population is open to cannabis regulation. Um, and that there has been a political context that is favorable to legalization since at least 2019. Um, and you could even, arguably you could say that even before 2019, there could have been the conditions if there was the political will to do so. Now, there have been attempts at legalizing cannabis before, and this has actually been happening for the last 20 years. We've had a party, uh, well, Moises' party, who's unfortunately not here, that has been systematically proposing the legalization of cannabis for the last 20 years. It hasn't happened. Um, and then we had, we had a kind of some momentum in 2019. Uh, we had, for instance, the Global Commission on Drug Policy presenting their report in Lisbon. Uh, you had a lot of um, influential uh, personalities stating that they were pro-legalization in Portugal as well. There was some momentum, then COVID happened, and you know, when COVID happens, uh, you will not knock on the door of the health minister and say, hey, do you want to legalize cannabis? That won't happen. Um, and so that's mostly the reason why the issue froze for the last two years. Uh, right now, there is, there is again a push for legalization. Um, the, the left bloc has submitted a bill uh, last week. Uh, now we're just waiting for the bill to be scheduled. Uh, we, we're still not uh, sure about the timings. And there was also a push for legalization in, in 2021, but the issue died because the government fell. Uh, there was no vote on it. Um, it was uh, decided by all parties that this should be discussed in the health commission. The government fell. Parliament was was um, dissoluted, and then we're beginning again. Uh, and so there's something of a, a déjà vu here happening. So wh why should I be confident that this time it will happen? Well, there is political stability, right? So allegedly we'll have a government going on for four years. Um, so of course, things might change, but I think we can now at least uh, officially count on four years of government. So we have a lot of time to get this done. We can involve all the stakeholders, hear all the necessary entities, uh, you know, uh, NGOs, experts, um, all kinds of political positions on this. All of this can be worked on. Now, why did I say political will? because there are a few issues in legalization that haven't been solved, completely solved, right? So things like driving, things like how to, um, how to, um, um, uh, how, to oversee, how to oversee homegrown plants, for instance, uh, what to do about the interaction between schizophrenia and cannabis use. All of those issues have been raised and they don't have like definite solutions for right now. But if there is political will, these okay. solutions will be found. So th that's a good point then. So I, uh, I get it that there's political will to legalize, but don't you think that 
then comes another difficult step, which is the political will and consensus on how to legalize. Because I see that every party, or not every party, but at least a few parties, political parties in Portugal want to legalize, but they all want to present their own bill, is what I understand. So, for example, if the Bloco de Esquerda bill were to be voted tomorrow, do you think Iniciativa Liberal would vote in favor of it? Okay, so I, I get the issue even though in our context, or given what the parliamentary practice in Portugal is, that's not a problem. So, for instance, uh, so we recently discussed euthanasia uh, in Portugal. So, many parties proposed their own bills, and there were different bills with different conditions, but all parties voted in favor of each other's bills, and then everyone agreed to just discuss it, uh, discuss the details in the proper commission. Uh, and so, this would be probably what would happen in case you had a discussion on cannabis. So, you would have three or four bills. Uh, all pro-legalization parties would agree to vote in favor of each other's bills and then would just adjust the details later. Even if these bills, and feel free to, to also uh, uh, give your opinion here, even if these bills include uh, growing at home, for example, which I understand has been a divisive issue in the past? Sorry. Uh, <coughs> yes, I think it, it will not be. So you see the Socialist Party in favor of a bill that includes growing at home? Yes, I don't. Okay. I don't think. I don't. I don't see any. You any too. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure. I think that the, the socialists are kind of the wild card in the process. Because that's right what now. I'm seeing, right? So you have you have one party that is extremely in favor, or more than one party, including Iniciativa Liberal and Bloco de Izquierda. I understand both extremely in Two favor. Two parties, actually. Extremely in favor of mm -hmm. growing at home. I would doubt that you would vote in favor of a bill not including the right to grow at home. But then the Socialist Party doesn't seem to be very convinced of that. So that's where I'm going, right? You what you don't have in Portugal, that, and we will go to Germany in a second, is a coalition that has already agreed to have a common uh, bill and go forward with that. So maybe in that regard, Portugal is still, even if you already have the bill in the parliament, Germany still doesn't have the bill that will be voted. What you don't have in Portugal, at least from my point of view externally, is uh, an agreement among different political parties that want to legalize in terms of how to legalize. Is that a fair assessment? Um, so we never really got to the part where we discussed to the details. Okay. So we've had general, generic discussions on should we legalize, shouldn't we legalize. Uh, if you read the previous debates, uh, many issues were discussed in parallel, but none of them was actually discussed in depth. So we need for that in-depth discussion to happen before and then understand if the final bill will be passable or not. Uh, but I think that there is a will, at least from the pro-legalization parties, to cooperate in such a way that we still get some kind of legalization happens, even if it's not perfect. Uh, we don't need to be maximizers about this, because if we try to be completely maximizers about legalization, uh, then it probably won't happen uh, and you can't really have a pro-legalization side completely split because so that would be counterproductive. So you see the possibility of pragmatism, finding a common denominator and doing something that is agreeable to Bloco de Izquierda, Iniciativa Liberal, Socialist Party, uh, so maybe even PDS? So of course, we'll, in our communication, we'll, we'll, we will underline what our differences with the left bloc are. But that's okay. part of the game. They will also criticize us. We will debate this in Parliament. Uh, but I don't think that we want to um, completely um, destroy the whole process of legalizing on account of that. I think there should be a healthy debate, and it's important that we have different perspectives going on in the, in the debate floor, but I think everyone that wants legalization understands that it's better to have some kind of legalization even if imperfect. I, d I don't expect the, the Initiative of Liberal Bill to be uh, completely proved as it is and passed as it is, right? That would be the ideal world, but we don't live in an, in the, uh, an ideal world. Um, so it's, it's really about, um, and, and this, this is another issue, it's really about the, also the government being on board with this um, because we have an absolute majority, so the Socialist Party controls the parliament and the Socialist Party is also dependent on what the government wants to do or not. Uh, and so we need to see some political will on part of the government to get on board with this um, before knowing whether legalization will happen or not. Now, I think there, is, there are political conditions. I think there is po it is possible to get a majority in parliament, but we need to convince the government that there are good gains both in public health, 
economic gains, etc., to be had from legalizing cannabis. So in this case, we also need civil society to get on board with this and to do its, its job on doing you know, nonpartisan campaigns for legalization, explaining to the public all the benefits that we can extract from a legalized cannabis market, et cetera, et cetera. So there's only so much parties can do because we have our own perspective that we want to push, of course, and it's part of the deal. We have to also to, um, uh, to pulverize some, some issues with other parties, but that's healthy. That's all part of democratic discourse. Guys, sorry to, to keep you waiting there. Uh, <laughs> let's, go, let's go to Germany now. Um, slightly different situation. In Germany, we do have a coalition uh, government, three different parties that have stated explicitly in the coalition agreement that they do want to legalize. However, what we have in the coalition agreement is one paragraph, basically, that doesn't say much. And um, again, it comes to the issue on, of, of how to do it. Uh, it it's, it's a difficult question once you start discussing how to do it. You mentioned the Green Party bill from previous years that may or may not be the foundation of the new bill. There's no guarantee, at least, that it will be. I, I would assume that they will look, take a look at it, but we have no guarantee that that will be the new bill. Actually, right now, consultation process just started to gather information from experts, and it looks like the health ministry, which is led by social democrats, will present a bill to parliament. And then we will probably have a healthy debate in Parliament in terms of how to do it. And do you see there that there could be differences that could delay this forever in terms of, for example, the right to grow at home, which is not included in the coalition agreement, at least not explicitly? <coughs> No, I don't think so. Uh, so uh, once uh, a bill uh, comes up in Bundestag, uh, it has been prepared so thoroughly that it will be agreed on after four to six months. Um, and uh, the Social Democrats, uh, just lately, it's not known yet really, but they voted also for uh, uh, home grow. Uh, um, voted? Home grow, for home Vo cultivation. What do you mean they voted? Uh, uh, the Social Democrats. They, so they Agreed that they, they will agreed that uh, because the liberal is a but liberal was it an official stance of the Social Democratic Party or was it one politician saying that he? No, it's an idea? official stand of the um, um, of the fraction of the Bundestag okay. uh, group. So now all three it's parties. It's not are published yet, but it will be published in the next days. Uh, so all of them are in favor of uh, of home grow. So uh, once the legislative process starts, uh, how do you see it happening? No, the decisive phase is right now uh, with this consultation, uh, with this hearing process uh, the Federal Drug Commissioner initiated uh, just now. Uh, of course, they want to listen to everyone, uh, to the, all these uh, uh, psychiatrists, associations, uh, Addiction uh, su associations. Uh, su su suggesting uh, to uh, minimize uh, the THC content in uh, dried flowers to a certain percentage. Uh, which makes absolutely no sense uh, because then the police is going after if you have 15.5 percent THC in your strain or not. So, the, from a from a liberal uh, from a societal uh, standpoint, nothing would change. There would still be police action, and we see that right now. The law is enforced, will be enforced till the last day. I have criminal cases, I'm a defense lawyer for these hemp businesses uh, and we have still really uh, harsh uh, convictions of CBD traders, for example, losing a lot of money, um, uh, facing um, um, imprisonment um, uh, of 9, 8, 12 months on probation. So Kai, so co considering full legalization is a difficult process, takes time, why not decriminalize first then? <coughs> that was a big debate, but uh, the situation is uh, sort of um, uh, sort of delicate. Uh, so they are afraid. Uh, the traffic light coalition is afraid to split that up. So if you split up that process and you decriminalize first, which would be easy, it was just we. we have, uh, I'm a board member of Leap Germany, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and we uh, submitted uh, uh, um, uh, a draft uh, to change the uh, Narcotic Act. It's just one sentence, and all this would stop, you know. And they said, no, if we start to initiate this process now, we will probably lose uh, to um, to uh, regulate uh, the supply chain, the licensed supply chain, and they want they want one draft, uh, one draft. Uh, but the pressure again was so high uh, uh, after uh, February, um, uh, as um, the pandemic, as, uh, as we see it, it's, it's a health issue. It's for harm reduction, it's for public health to regulate cannabis. That's the consensus we have in Germany. So the whole project was assigned to the Ministry of Health. 
the Ministry of Health was in February completely overwhelmed by the pandemic, uh, by the starting war, uh, integrating uh, 100,000 of, of Ukrainians into the German uh, social system and uh, taking care of uh, Ukraine uh, war uh, um, uh, patients, etc. And then the other, the Liberals and the Green Party, made pressure on the, on the health minister uh, and uh, they said, we want a draft in October. And uh, so the health minister um, made eight or ten new positions uh, possible uh, within his uh, realm. Uh, the federal drug commissioner started this consultation hearing, etc. But um, the, the Cannabis Control Act will definitely be the blueprint. It's a completely worked out law considering every aspects which are decisive from social responsibility, <coughs> from education of the staff uh, of, the, of the Cambridge social clubs, taxation, import, export, um, uh, lots of uh, uh, bylaws uh, uh, supporting the, 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 the main regulation. Uh, so you just can implement it. Uh, what is in at stake or what, what is uh, in debate right now are these questions. Do we, shall we uh, minimize the THC content in the strain, uh, how many plants for home grow, uh, how, many, how much possession, 30 gram, 60 gram, only 15 gram, all these small little details which you just have to adjust in these uh, existing bill uh, debate right now. In and terms of uh, social justice that you mentioned, the blueprint of the Green Party, I find it a little bit surprising there that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I read it a couple of years ago when it was first presented, but if I remember correctly, those that have already been criminalized due to drug trafficking, in particular cannabis trafficking, would not be able to be part of the new legal system. Don't you think that that could yeah, and should yeah, change? Yeah, That's, um, there are a couple of points in this draft uh, which I don't agree as well. Uh, one is uh, the one with the former convicts of uh, narcotic, meant, yeah. uh, narcotic uh, 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 convictions. They will be in jail seeing that so Other yeah, will be yeah, making yeah, but money this doing the this same this thing. Is the, uh, th this is uh, also a debate right now, for sure. The, the matter of social equity, uh, we see that debate in the U.S. and in, in Canada. Uh, they have other problems because their communities uh, have uh, yeah, s strong problems with their minorities. We don't have that in Germany as, as much. Uh, m most of the supply uh, in the illegal market was from growers who supplied some of their friends and some of their community or real mafia organized crime gangs and we don't want these guys back in business uh, but uh, a simple uh, narcotic conviction uh, that shouldn't prevent you from from uh, entering this business uh, if there was no violence involved for example we have a var variety or will have a variety of bills in portugal to choose from what will be the stance there can you guide me through that in terms of social justice issues or in particular whether those that have been criminalized for dealing cannabis would be able to be part of the new business that will be legal um so uh, uh, unfortunately that that isn't on the table yet um so it's a bit too early to have that discussion there are still some hoops that we need to that we need to jump before getting to that conversation, um, because before getting to that conversation, you you need to establish that this was that prohibition was absolutely unfair, and you also need to establish that in Portugal prohibition is still the law, because there's this idea that because we decriminalize drugs, uh, we become a non-prohibitionist state. Now Portugal still has a form of soft prohibitionism. We need to explain that that soft prohibitionist prohibitionism was happening, that you still have a lot of arbitrary things going on, even in our context. For instance, even if you have, even if you uh, carry with you uh, the, uh, the, the criminalized amount of cannabis that, that's allowed according to the law, the police can still arbitrarily seize what you have with you. Um, and then they can send you to, um, to go talk to a um, dissuasion commission, uh, where it will explain that, Mr. I won't do it again. This was a massive mistake, etc., uh, etc. Et so we still have a, a really paternalistic approach to drugs in Portugal, um, and actually, the, the, uh, in many senses, the paternalist, um, uh, the paternalist perspective on the decriminalization is still uh, dominating the perspective on drugs in Portugal. It's not that everyone already recognizes that people have the right to do what they want with their bodies as long as they're not, um, uh, they're not doing harm to others. Um, so I think that that's a very important issue. 
Um, this should be approached eventually, but we still need to get to the first steps, that is recognizing that there is a need to legalize, there are many advantages in legalizing, we still have a very paternalistic and arbitrary law going on in Portugal, and once you've established that, then you can have a conversation about all of those people who were unfairly prosecuted um, for um, being in the, in, in the business of cannabis before uh, prohibition handed. When it comes to paternalism, the bill presented by Bloco de Esquerda, and unfortunately we don't have Moises here to defend that bill. Um, I, I was saying that I was reading it by before coming here, and it includes a bunch of things that may seem paternalistic, at least for Iniciativa Liberal, I guess. Uh, this include the possibility of the government then uh, setting up a maximum THC limit, something that is being discussed in Germany as well right now. Also, the prohibition of every kind of advertisement, plain packaging, do you think that in order to be realistic and find a common denominator we were speaking and a consensus to legalize something being that better than nothing, we will have to accept that whatever bill ends up being discussed in Portugal and finally approved will have to include all these paternalistic approaches? Well, <coughs> I, I agree with you. I think there are some paternalistic ideas on the on the on the block of the bill. It's 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 what George said a few minutes ago. It's it, probably we will probably we will need to make some 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 concessions to to in the parliament to have a, a jointly bill that we can approve. But I think. I think it will be very hard that Initiative Liberal accepts all <laughs> those paternalist aspects, and I think it will be very hard that Bloc Esquerda will accept the withdrawal of some of these paternalist ideas from the bill. So, I think we need to see what's happening in in the discussions and <laughs> and in the in the in the in the debates on the on the bills, and let's see what happens. But I think it will be a very a very funny discussion. Guy in in Germany. It looks like we will also have the prohibition of advertisement and things like that. Um, do you think that, again, in order to be realistic and, and, and have chances of success with the bill, it cannabis will end up being regulated more strict than alcohol? Or would it be at the same level of alcohol? Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, in interesting point. Uh, look at Canada. They uh, legalized the uh, dried flowers uh, first in April uh, 2018. And in October, uh, they legalized uh, edibles and beverages. Uh, but between October and uh, April and October, uh, Aurora, for example, started a campaign, a public campaign. Hey guys, hey people, we have their new products coming online, and um, they are, have a they they have a different impact on you. So if you uh, digest it, uh, it's different than than you smoke it. And uh, they tried with this campaign. Uh, to give the public an idea of these of these products uh, for safety reasons, and that was very good, I, I think. So maybe this is an, an role model also for other countries. Uh, first, legalize the uh, the, the the flowers, uh, and then start a campaign uh, informing the people. But this informing shouldn't be advertising, and you shouldn't be uh, get uh, get caught for that, or is it uh, should be allowed. And this border between advertising and informing about products has to be defined very well, uh, so that companies don't get in trouble uh, when informing about a new strain, or how much THC the strain has, or the terpene profile. This must be allowed, and this shouldn't be advertising. Uh, of course, billboards on highways or uh, blinky neon stuff in, in, in inner city areas, I don't think that's uh, appropriate. What about plain packaging? Do you see it as a possibility that whatever bill will be presented in Germany, it will include mandatory plain packaging, like in Uruguay, for example, or to a certain extent in Canada? The Cannabis Control Act uh, doesn't say about this uh, anything. Uh, if you have the dried flowers, uh, you... Um, uh, as I saw it in in, in in Denver, in Colorado, for example, you get a you get a, a pack with the logo of the uh, uh, of the of the shop, and then you get a sticker on it with all the information, and uh, that's fine. Uh, what else do you want? If it comes to finished products, uh, there should be some packaging, some information on the packaging. Uh, but once again, uh, you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be allowed to write on it, uh, take me, uh, I will take you away for hours, I'm <laughs> the best stuff, or whatever. Uh, th that, that can't work, of course. Uh, 
sorry for the interruption. We will have Q&A at the end, and yeah. you will let me know when, or? Whenever you want. Oh, I, I'm not following the time, so you, you, you stop me whenever you want. How much time now? Uh, okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> we had the last ones. <laughs> Keep it going. Kai, since I'm with you, uh, another thing in, in Germany um, that we haven't spoken about, um, the government currently has the majorities needed to pass the bill in the Bundestag or the lower house, but the Bundesrat or the higher house is still or could still be controlled by CDU, CSU, Union, Conservatives, however you want to call it. Um, the recent elections that we had in North Rhine-Westfalen, it looks like it will be a government that will include again the CDU there, which means they could control those votes as well. And this means that until the Hessen elections next autumn, uh, the Bundesrat will remain potentially, or in practice as well, controlled by conservatives. They, if, if whatever bill is approved in the lower house needs consent from the higher house, which is likely to be the case for such a comprehensive le legalization, um, then conservatives could block it in the higher house, potentially. Uh, with this, I mean, I mean, we are all very excited discussing all these details. Should we have a limit of THC? What about packaging? What about pharmacies selling it or not? And then when it comes to the higher house, they say no. And then what do we do with that? Um, what, don't you see a risk there? That's a, a compli complicated constitutional issue for, for sure. Uh, so in principle, uh, the federal government, the Bundestag, can decide about uh, the criminal law and the narcotic law as part of the criminal law. So they can decide we decriminalize it and they don't need the consent of the Bundesrat, of the lower house. But if it affects the Länder, the states, then it will need Bundesrat. Yeah, they have the, it's written in the constitution, Article 74, uh, the federal government or the federal um, uh, state uh, has the right to decide about criminal law, etc. Um, and uh, then the federal government can also decide about uh, rules of commercialization, okay? So, and then you have to put these two things together, and still uh, the uh, government is uh, authorized to, uh, to draft a bill on, on these rules, okay? Uh, but then when it comes to uh, the execution of this new law, and uh, the more the federal government regulates the details of the execution of the law, the Bundesrat has to consent to this law. So what happens then ha has happened uh, in 50 years of, or 60 years of history of, 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 of federal, of, of, of Bundesrepublik, um, so they bring it up to the Bundestag, it's passed on in Bundestag, they bring it to the Bundesrat, Bundesrat says no, no consent, then they take it back, take out these rules which are too detailed and bring it back to Bundesrat, because Bundesrat doesn't have to consent then anymore. The problem then is that you have a, a framework of law, but the Bundesländer, the federal states, can execute that in their own uh, responsibility. Good which might Bayern lead to <laughs> the fact that you have a different situation in Bavaria uh, than in Berlin. Uh, Bavaria doesn't want that, so they maybe only license one uh, dispensary in an industrial area somewhere in Munich where everyone has to buy it, and you have 5,000 clients uh, every day, and there is no time for consulting, for talking to the people, for talking about cannabis, for, for uh, talking about the needs of the c uh, consumer. Uh, and then you have a situation in Berlin where you have, like in Amsterdam, these coffee shop culture evolving and a small safe places where people can talk to the uh, to the to the uh, butt tenders as the cannabis control act foresees it that they should um, consult their their, their clients uh, that's the big thing the big danger that we don't have a very unanimous uh, um, unified uh, solution over germany then that could change by the end of next year but as of now that's the situation right but in, in fact, uh, the resistance of the conservatives is, is, uh, against cannabis reform is, uh, is vanishing. Uh, you hear that every now and then, from, from even from high officials in, in Bundestag. And this is a, a, a whole societal reform project, which uh, ends up uh, st yeah, stigma, stagnation uh, of, of 40 years. And the conservative party, if they want to have uh, 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 yeah, uh, an electoral win uh, in the in the future. Well, <laughs> they will have to shift. They will have to move. They will have to modernize. 
I agree with you there, but there's another risk that you bring there, and it is that the Conservative Party is not doing that bad now. After the war in Ukraine, now in terms of polls, they are again the number one party. Social Democrats are the third party now in terms of polls. Don't you see a risk there that the Conservative Party will say we are happy as we are? No, that's a normal wave after uh, when you won the uh, federal election and you are in power and people see that you are hard working and it doesn't work out uh, uh, immediately, uh, of course the polls go, go mm -hmm. down, but that's uh, not representative for, for the situation right, right okay. now. It's only a couple of percent. Back to Portugal. Um, and about the risks of maybe over-regulation, or l forget that, let, let me ask the question another way. You have medical cannabis functioning here in Portugal. However, that's more like a for export only thing. I do get it that it is possible to get a prescription here in Portugal, but as I understand, not even 10 kilograms were sold last year here in Portugal. That represents maybe 20 patients, so there are more people now here in this auditorium than patients in Portugal accessing to legal products. In the same time, thousands of kilograms have been exported to other countries. So what would you, I mean, that to me shows me that, that something has failed in terms of the medical program in Portugal. I mean, it has been successful to export to Germany, Israel or Australia maybe, but it has not been successful to provide Portuguese patients in need with medical cannabis. So what do you both think we can learn from that for when it comes to adult use legalization, that it doesn't get stuck in maybe over regulation or whatever it may be, that yes, the law was approved, but then there's no real access. Um, so, um, uh, as, far, as far as I'm aware, um, we, we have a regulatory authority, we have Infermed who decides under which conditions can medical cannabis be, be prescribed. Um, and right from the beginning, it had a very limited set of contexts where medical cannabis could be prescribed. Uh, and it's been somewhat slow moving in opening up more contexts under which you can, you can um, prescribe medical cannabis. Plus. Uh, right now, they're still expensive. Uh, so there's a price po problem. Um, there's some discussion on whether uh, the state should can participate uh, medical cannabis products like it does with other medical products. Um, unfortunately, medical cannabis still has somewhat of a special status among other medicines, which is very silly. Actually, I've never really come to grips on why should the medical use of any substance uh, be prohibited. It's medical use. It's a very specific kind of use. So it has nothing to do with cannabis. And by the way, mixing medical and, and adult use of cannabis, those are very different issues. Um, one of them is way, way more simple. But anyway, um, it's, it's mostly been a regulatory issue as far as, far as I understand. Maybe you know more about it than, um, than I do. Um, and there's also uh, the, the price points. Now, exports, it's, it's easier to export, right? Because most of the exports are dry flour, as far as I'm aware. Uh, it's been growing exponentially. That's something that's very easy, very easy to do regulatory as long as you have agreements with, with, the, the, with the destination countries. Now, when you're talking about medicines, well, the pharma sector in Portugal, like in many countries, is very regulated. Portugal tends to regulate more than countries that over-regulate. So, um, so that's, that's my fear with good. recreational as well, right? That you approve the law, but then it, it's up to a bunch of different agencies to regulate it however they want, and then at the end you don't have any real access, or at least much less than what it should be to really uh, get rid of the black market. market. Yeah. Th so those. So on now on 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 adult use, and actually I would actually get back to some of the points that Kai Friedrich made uh, earlier. There is, there is a tendency, uh, and it's part of the political culture in Portugal, and I'm quite uh, I'm at will to say this because one of the things that the, my party is always saying is that there is a tendency to over-regulate, and there is a certain political culture in Portugal that tends to, or tries to uh, foresee every single uh, use case and situation that could possibly happen to three people in the whole country. Uh, and this is for most laws, and this is certainly the case for cannabis. And so politicians tend to get bogged down on the details while missing the bigger picture when they're regulating, especially new products. And so uh, in, in the case of, of, of beverages and food, for instance, um, so no other party has, um, so there have been uh, almost proposals from other parties. So even though we know what the left bloc has proposed and what my party has proposed, we have an idea of what other parties think as well on, on cannabis, at least on the pro-legalization side. And there's a lot of people who are not comfortable with beverages and drinks. 
Now, my question here would be is, why would the state discriminate on modes of using cannabis? Why should the state indirectly say, you can use cannabis, but you have to smoke it? You can't eat it, you can't drink it, you have to smoke it. Especially when you know that smoking has some side effects that are not positive, because you are inhaling smoke. Inhaling smoke is not a good thing, even if you don't have tobacco in it. Um, and this, this is mind-boggling for me, um, but still, um, there is, this is, this is the start point for many people is, okay, we legalize cannabis, but it has to be weed. If it's not weed, you shouldn't use it. But there is never really an explanation for this, or there is an explanation is that it would incentivize use, etc., etc. No data confirms this. Uh, so actually, the, the jury is still out on whether consumption has really increased dramatically for young people which is the, the issue that's always being raised, not adults, for young people, in context where cannabis um, was legalized. This will be a very hard discussion in many aspects, yeah. Ricardo, some final words in terms of what risks you <coughs> see in Portugal of implementation? Let's assume that legalization is done. So let me just get back a little back to, to, to the, the initial intervention of George. I think that our, the problems on medical cannabis are, 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 are those that George referred, we have, uh, we have, the price is really high, so we have one medicine in the market, and even with co-payment, it, it costs around 300 euros, which is a lot in a country that... I mean, monthly treatment, or what do you mean? Yeah, month? monthly treatment, which it, is a it's, lot. It's one third of the average weight. Yeah, that's it, that's right, <laughs> exactly. So it's impossible to ask some, a normal Portuguese person to pay 300 euros for a me medicine each month. It's, it's totally impossible. And I think this problem, this problem will only be resolved when the state uh, starts to co-pay uh, the cannabis product, the medical cannabis products in the same terms that they co-pay the other, the other medicines. And the other problem, I think it's the, the doctors because from my, from my experience, and I, I, I was speaking with a lot of doctors, and I don't feel that they are comfortable, comfortable to prescribe medical cannabis products to its patients. And I think there's a lot of work to be, to be done by the industry, by the, 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 the cannabis industry and the cannabis researchers to provide doctors with evidence, giving them, giving them comfort to prescribe cannabis products to, his, to, 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 to the, the person, sorry, to the person who needs the, the, those products. Regarding use, uh, adult use cannabis, I don't see that the, these kind of problems are also uh, verified in the, in the adult use cannabis. Because from the, my analysis to the Bloc Esquerda bill, the 22, 2022 bill, one of the things that I note is that, that the, it was il eliminated the, the reference to Infarmed. So uh, Infarmed is not part of the process anymore. So I think, given that Infarmed is not in the process anymore, and that is totally off the health products, I think the, the, I think the, the, the authorizations and the process to obtain an authorization for marketing will be easier. Of course, it's a cannabis product, so it will be a very, a very, uh, very uh, hard surveillance on it, but I think... Not like will, plutonium. Yes, of okay. course. <laughs> okay. Yes, not at all. Q&A? At all. Laura, Q&A, is okay? Okay, I have one hand there. Tesh, right? Hi, Tesh. <laughs> <laughs> we can. Yeah. yeah. Now I can see you. <laughs> No, no luck. Okay, that, yeah. that's, that's better. That's good. Okay. Th thank you. So, question for the panel on the UN Single Convention uh, on Narcotics, so the 1961 convention that, 
that we sometimes invoke in this uh, industry. What, what happens after Germany legalizes? Because this is in the Eurozone, there's Schengen, there's single market. Uh, does this force other countries to kind of legalize just being de facto having a, such a large land border and being in the single market? <clears throat> yeah, a good point, but it uh, could fill a whole conference on its own. Uh, for sure, I'll try to answer it very briefly. Um, so Germany has a demand of 400 to 500 tons um, when the tourists are coming, uh, probably 100 tons more. Uh, so we are talking about 400 to 600 tons dried flowers alone as the demand for Germany. Uh, Germany won't be able to produce that domestically uh, within one day uh, from when legal sales start. So Germany is really depending on imports. Uh, <coughs> There are two different options. Uh, you can terminate the single convention and re-entry with the reservation of cannabis. That doesn't solve your problem uh, of the goods coming in uh, to sell uh, in, in the retail. Uh, so you have to find allies, allied mine nations, uh, which you conclude mini treaties uh, with. Uh, with Article 41 of the Vienna uh, Convention on International Treaties. Uh, this allows to modify existing international treaties with the states who think the old treaty is outdated and uh, we need some change. And uh, this is the task of the German government, to find these allied nations uh, to negotiate trade contracts uh, within this interstate modification procedure. Uh, I think we saw that in the medical area, um, uh, the first two years only Canada and the Netherlands were exporting medical cannabis to Germany and then every, all many countries showed up like Lesotho, South Africa, Uruguay, Australia, uh, etc. And the same will happen with recreational cannabis if these countries which have these facilities already in place in perfect climate conditions, uh, outdoor glass greenhouse grow all over, all over the year, uh, with uh, labor costs, uh, uh, appropriate labor costs, uh, they will also create the preconditions to export to, to Germany, and that is what is going to happen, I guess. I would add to that that it's, however, easier said than done. In the case of denouncing the single convention and re-entering with a reservation, that is, of course, possible, and it is within what the single convention itself says. However, that would mean that all of the signat from all of the signatories, the signatories of the convention, which are basically almost all of the countries in the world, not more than one third oppose that. So if one third of the countries of the world oppose, for example, Germany denouncing the convention and then re-entering with a cannabis reservation, then that path is effectively blocked. So it is a possibility, however, it would take a lot of diplomatic efforts to convince a lot of countries to not oppose that move of Germany. We Bolivia we did it in the past, it's the only precedent that we have, but they could argue that based on indigenous tradition, traditions, it would be harder for Germany to argue on indigenous traditions of cannabis use. And, um, and even if so, see how complicated it was to reschedule cannabis for medical purposes in December 2020, which was a cosmetic move, only one vote difference. I would assume that there will be a lot of opposition in the world to Germany legalizing cannabis and entering with a reservation. And when it comes to the interse modification, again, that's also a possibility. However, the Vienna Treaty that stipulates that possibility is from 1980 and it does not apply retroactively. It's Article 4 saying the convention applies only to treaties which are concluded by states after the entry into force of the present convention with regard to such states. So the single convention is from 1961, it was modified in 71. This possibility is established by a treaty from 1980. I, it's at least debatable whether an interstate agreement for recreational cannabis could happen. Again, I think it's mostly a diplomatic effort than a legal effort. Let's see how willing Germany is to go to other countries and propose such a thing and whether these countries would have the political weight to actually do that on an international level. And ju just to be clear, Alfredo, on your point, so you think UN will trump Eurozone sovereignty, so within the Eurozone? It is not about that. Yeah, I, so Uruguay and Canada legalize and everyone says nothing happened, that's true, right? It's, it, it, it could be done. It is, it is not black or white, the interpretation of international treaties. Uh, like when Uruguay did it, and that's actually what I'm gonna speak about 
tomorrow in the morning. Um, it did so based on human rights arguments and, and uh, certain justifications that are, exp are, are very valid in the case of the single convention. Uruguay did not denounce the convention to re-enter. Uruguay did not do a si an inter agreement with other countries. Uruguay did it. The INCB, which is the agency kind of enforcing the treaties on an international level, didn't like it, but they had to accept it, and they became softer as years went by and nothing bad really happened. So no, th there will not be blue helmets invading Germany. If that, of course, that's not going happen. Uh, however, it could have political consequences, right? And particularly being an EU country, that's the first time that it will be done inside the European Union. And Germany and other European Union countries have been quite, um, I don't want to say aggressive, but in a way aggressive towards Eastern European countries such as Poland or Hungary in terms of in infringement procedures for things that Poland or Hungary or other countries have been doing in the European Union that were not compliant with international law, in particular EU law. So I wouldn't like uh, German legalization being the payback uh, chance for Poland or Hungary to say, hey, now it's you that you're not doing things right. Let's go to the European Court of Justice and see who's right about this, right? Um, so it's at the end of the day a, a diplomatic effort more than a legal interpretation, I think. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks a lot, it was a great discussion. This is for the Portuguese speakers. Um, you were saying that uh, um, there is still a lack of education among uh, doctors, but actually I'm seeing a growing interest, um, not only about uh, doctors, but nurses and health professionals. I think the main problem of this uh, therapeutic option is that we don't have products, so we have one flower that is super difficult to titulate and uh, it's super expensive. So in the first month to start the treatment, a patient has to spend 500 euros. So 350 for the vaporizer and then 150 for the flower. And then each month 100, 150, which it's a lot. So I think the, the really first step that we really, need, we really need is the reimbursement and uh, more products. So what do you think that we as health professionals should do to really um, uh, achieve that because okay education is the key and I really believe that and I agree but I think we are doing that and doctors are doing that they have interest but it's not easy to work with this flower with 18% of THC it's not easy uh, at all so what what is your opinion what we should do about this Thank you. That's, that's exactly my point. I think the main problem now, because it's, it's a closed circle, because if you, if you don't have prescriptions, you will not have product in the market because no one will, will buy it. So what I think, I think the key, the key issue now is the, is the co-payment by the state. Because considering that, and, and with the resolution of Infarmed, with the eight indicational, indication ther therapeutic, therapeutical indications, we can see, it's clear that medical cannabis can only be prescribed as last resort. So if, if we have a product or a medicine or whatever as last resort, and if we uh, co-pay at a rate of 100% the previous stage of the treatment chain, why, why don't co-pay also the cannabis product? Because if it's a last resort, uh, treatment. I think we should we should co-pay, and I think the co-payment by the states is the key. It's the it's the main issue right now. Of course, the the lack of products in the market. It's it's just the econo economical ratio. It's if you don't have no one to buy it, you 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 will not put products in the market. As soon as you have, as soon as we have uh, 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 doctors prescribing, I'm sure that we will have products in the market. Okay, thank you. In the back, I'm probably not gonna hear you from here. <laughs> and that's why the education is important because I think, I, I, I sorry, I usually, I, 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 some, I spoke with a lot of doctors and health professionals and there's only, we need comfort and we need evidence and medical evidence to, to prescribe cannabis for. Excuse me. Why the, the companies that are, they are legal here and they are exporting to the other countries that the, the, they are legal, why that products are not selling in our country? 
why Infarmed doesn't allow that same products are selling in, por in Portugal. It's up to companies. The companies should apply for a For a example, Tilray? Sorry? Well, Tilray is selling in for Portugal. For example, yeah. Tilray? Tilray, Tilray is, selling, is selling a dry flower. No, why Tilray, for example, or other countries that are in exporting to, por to other countries that uh, they are uh, in their they are disposal uh, other percentages of THC why that flowers are not being selling in Portugal why Infarmed doesn't allow that Infarmed Infarmed has allowed one one preparation until now is from Tiller I will I believe and it's and, uh, and as far as I'm aware there are some pending applications to to a new ACMs as we say in Portugal which is a authorization for placement in the market so as soon as Infarmed uh, allow the, the, the commercialization of such products, it will, they will be available in the market. So Infarmed has its own uh, internal processes as, and has its own it owns, uh, evaluation processes. And it, it's, I, can, I can answer you uh, why Infarmed is, is taking so... I understand, so but we have people uh, that are sick and we have children that they need a low percentage of THC. And if in the other countries they have scientists that they prove that that it's it's uh, it, that solved that problem or that uh, that uh, issue, and uh, in Portugal we have that companies that are exporting legal to other countries that already have the the proofs and the the, st the, the base of the science that that flower works. Why our in Portugal our government? doesn't take that uh, same studies and take that countries and say why we don't if we are producing this in portugal and we are exporting why we cannot consider selling this in portugal too i totally agree with you and i, I, I guess that's a question for these companies right I mean, yeah, not, none yeah. of these companies are in the panel yeah. at the moment but we can discuss about informatics it will be certainly a, a very long conversation so, but, but <laughs> i totally agree with you but it is what it is Guys, um, g great discussion. This, this question is more focused to the Portuguese uh, panelists. Um, as a roundup of today, we've seen doctors and professors speak, and there's been, uh, and um, dispensary people speak, and there's obviously been a clear distinction. Unlike Germany, and this is a reason for this question being focused more to Portugal, unlike Germany, where in the last couple of years, the medicinal element of cannabis has been you know growing rapidly they've learned from that and that's probably why they're now looking at an adult use market and putting that bill forward doesn't portugal run the risk bearing in mind what you've said today on two points one we probably we're more more of us here today than those being prescribed medicinal cannabis in portugal secondly that your bill invokes smoking cannabis Aren't we running the risk in Portugal f um, feeding the conservative narrative that cannabis is bad and cannibalizing the medicinal purposes of cannabis? Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't get the last part. Uh, well, basically, yeah. aren't we, aren't, as a political party, aren't you running the risk, forcing a narrative now for adult use when you haven't resolved the medicinal use cannibalizing the medicinal use because fundamentally you've got no access for patients and that will force patients to go down the adult use market rather than the medicinal use market and then not being able to see professionals like doctors in this arena yep. to actually focus on those patients that's that's a good question thank you um no but it's it's an interesting question so i so i hadn't thought about that angle but we, sh we should also understand what medical cannabis looks like in Portugal. Uh, so we're talking about, so there's one product, and I think it's, it's a topical product. No, it's a flower. No? Flower. Dry flower. Hmm? It's dry, dry flower. flower. Um, but it's a medicine. It's, yes, but, but it, has, it has a very limited use case right now, according to, to Infarmed. And I'm not sure if everyone who would use uh, cannabis is aware of what are the, of what are the, the legal conditions under which um, medical cannabis can can be prescribed. 
about the conservative forces and how both things can be mixed, I think that we can have a normal dialogue around medical cannabis in Portugal because it's already legalized. There have been there have been there have been no issues with it. Um, there have been no leaks uh, that people know of. You know, the issue of leaks was uh, one of the major arguments against medical cannabis because that you would have companies growing cannabis, then it would uh, leak into the black market, people would use it. That didn't happen. Uh, there are no cases, well, because there's almost no use, but anyway, there are no cases of people having any complications on account of using medical cannabis. Uh, so, and I think our legislators are aware that we can have a normal conversation on the use cases of medical cannabis, we have mostly an economic problem, uh, at least according to your explanation. There's not a lot of supply, there's not a lot of demand, that inflates prices as well. Um, so uh, companies really don't have room to uh, create scale um, in, in the Portuguese internal market. I think we can deal with that separately without, um, and, and you can have a discussion on the legalization of adult use without jeopardizing what we already done on medical cannabis. Oh, can I just answer that? I, th I think that's probably right in the sense of that's how most jurisdictions try and deal with that. The issue I see it, being a lawyer in the field and not really liking politics that much, um, if we stood back and if the efforts weren't on the adult use market, and I'm sure there's loads of people here that would want to invoke an adult use market, but the focus would be to support the doctors, because as the young lady said, there's an educational piece already, but actually support the narrative, maybe create, um, not through infrared, but another authority that supported that to create a sort of free market for medicines, so that would create that price bracket down, where the government would support that, you start learning. It's a, a, it's a learning curve. that You understand where the benefits are of medicine lies, then, a bit like Germany is doing at the moment, you can see how the adult, adult use market would work. Canada recently, and Cureleaf did a study on this, have found that the adult use market doesn't want to smoke. They don't care about smoking. It's a young market. They want edibles. They want something new and founded flavors and stuff like that. There's no way Portugal can get to that stage or any European country until the medicinal market is readily available to patients. It can still happen in a developed medical market, right? You mentioned Canada. When Canada legalized REC, it had already a developed medical market and then sales in the medical market started to decline uh, because patients were going to buy recreational products. So I get your point, just that it can happen in both cases, before you have a developed medical market, but even after as well. If, if patients just prefer the simplicity of uh, self-medicating. Uh, we have uh, I, I yeah. just wanted to, I just, so, so I, just, I just wanted to say two points. So I, so I understand the argument, and I, and I think it's, a, it's an inter interesting argument. But I, so like I said previously, I do take issue with mixing adult use cannabis with medical cannabis. They're wildly different, uh, separate issues. Uh, and, and in the last years, there's been a tendency in these kinds of, conferences and conversations just to mix both things. We need to legalize medical and adult use. Well, it's actually perfectly tenable to have medical cannabis and never legalizing adult use. Um, so um, I think we, we, we should be careful in, in, in devising a strategy that includes both things. Uh, and both things should be done separately. And I think that in the political discourse, you should be very clear in that medical cannabis and adult use cannabis are very different things. And when we, legal, when we are legalizing adult use cannabis, we are not in any way trying to um, uh, answer to the demand for medical use of cannabis. Some people may understand that their own personal use of cannabis is somewhat medical, but it is not medical. Uh, and that should be clear. That's their own self-interpretation, and they have every right to do so. But that is a whole different thing from what is essentially a, a substance that's going in the, the pharma industry pipeline, and then that's the end of the story. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, w w what we saw in, 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 in Germany, uh, the uh, medical cannabis imports of dried flowers in 2020 were 9 tons, uh, doubled to 20 tons in 2021, uh, and the predictions are for 35 tons for this year. 
so if uh, adult use will come, of course, this m part of the medical market will break away. Uh, but the prescription of medical cannabis in Germany is in the uh, complete discretion of the farmer, of the of the uh, of the doctor, uh, and uh, no one's going after these uh, prescriptions. Uh, so, uh, but most of the uh, wholesalers in Germany, which are now distributing the, the medical cannabis, will also uh, distribute the adult use uh, cannabis. So they are already in business, they stay in business, they open a second line. Uh, but uh, in terms of medical cannabis, uh, the medical cannabis industry can only survive if the, the data, the studies, the research will improve and finally uh, really bring up uh, results where people can rely on. Uh, and otherwise, the other people, the, the more recreational user, every user has a sort of precondition uh, why, and when he sticks to cannabis for over a long time. So, yeah, but it's hard to, um, to uh, demark, to de for demarcation. Yeah, sorry. The front, right? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, every time I listen to, to people from different countries and especially about the laws of each country, I always wonder, um, c considering what we see in the United States, which it, each state has its own laws and legislation, wouldn't it be, make sense to have a European regulation on cannabis and on CBD that would work for every country? Or why are we, you know, every country is doing their own little bit and legalizing this, legalizing that. Why doesn't this, you know, go up to Europe and then we can regulate the whole European market in this sense, either for medical cannabis, either for recreational use. That's because of the single convention we mentioned earlier. Uh, every member nation uh, of this uh, international treaty uh, are required to uh, set up their own rules uh, to prevent the use of medical, uh, of recreational cannabis uh, within their jurisdiction, so only um, scientific and medical purposes are allowed. And uh, yeah, there is a, a conflict of regimes of this International uh, Single Convention Treaty and the EU uh, treaties, um, and that's in the discretion of the member states. Uh, but you're completely right. Uh, what's, that's uh, the sense of the uh, EU. Uh, <coughs> to harmonize things, to strengthen the internal market. And uh, there was already a resolution in the European Parliament uh, calling for more research on medical cannabis and for more harmonization. And we will, I'm sure we will see that in the next uh, coming years. Yeah, but not much happened with that resolution from the Parliament. And playing devil's advocate here, uh, that question has been an answered already by European authorities. and. Their position is that there is already harmonization in Europe, in the European Union, when it comes to both CBD that you mentioned and medical cannabis. So when we let's start with medical cannabis, there is a centralized procedure by which you could get a medicine approved in the European Union that derives from cannabis. Nothing prevents a company from doing that. However, like any other medicine, you will need to go through clinical trials to prove the efficacy and safety of that specific product to treat specific conditions. That has been done already. Epidiolex has been approved through the centralized procedure in the European Union, the M uh, European Medicines Agency approved it, and it's available in the European Union. We might not like the price, we might not like a bunch of different things, but there is a centralized procedure by which you could get a cannabis-derived medicine approved in the European Union. What, however, when we talk about medical cannabis, we're usually referring to special access schemes or special ways of accessing to cannabis flower or, e or extracts, products that may or may not, products that must comply with certain quality requirements in terms of their production, but that do not have clinical trials behind these specific products to prove specific efficacy and safety. For that, the European Union cannot force that into Hungary, Poland, or whatever other country to go through that because it's simply not part of European legislation. When it comes to products with marketing authorization, there is a centralized procedure, it is harmonized. Uh, that's the counter argument from European authorities. And when it comes to CBD, that's a completely different story if we are talking about CBD for food products. Again, we have the novel food procedure. So that's a European level harmonization. We might not like it because of different reasons, but it is there, right? We could argue that these rules should change, should be different, but uh, that there are no rules at the European level for cannabis in terms of harmonization. I would say it's not entirely correct. 
um, and the European Union leaves it up to specific individual countries to have their own specific special access schemes through magistral preparations in the case of Germany or like they did in Portugal, an ad hoc uh, legislation for medical cannabis that is kind of parallel to the uh, all the other medicines, right? That's up to individual countries. I agree with you, there's differences, big differences among European countries, but there's also some European harmonization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look at look at uh, CBD flowers, uh, which is highly uh, um, disputed in, in, in Germany. CBD flowers, for example, are uh, legal in Belgium, Austria, and Luxembourg. Uh, and uh, we started uh, two lawsuits against the Federal Republic of Germany. The, pre free, the, the principle of free movement of goods, if they are legal in these countries, they must be legal in Germany and marketable. Uh, and uh, this is an ongoing process. And uh, so, uh, like Slovakia just uh, legalized CBD a uh, couple of months or one year ago. So we have to look at every member state to see, regardless of the noble food regime, if that product is uh, legal uh, from, the, from the narcotic regime itself. So, but yeah, we should work on that. Hi, I actually have four questions for the Portuguese speakers. Uh, well, I'm gonna go pretty much fast on the first one, which is for George, why you say there's a big difference between recreational and medical. Second is, what's the problem on that? By saying specifically and emphasizing that. And the third is, why prevention? Like me preventing a disease, it's not considered a medical action. And fourth, what are the solutions that actually are proposed on those bills? Because as so far, I understand that none of you has ever asked any of us professionals in this field how policies should be designed, how they should be evaluated or reviewed over the ones that are already been done, some inconsistencies that should be reviewed and re redone, rewritten again. So my question is, what is, where is that work, man? Like. So these are all for George, right? Um, so, so regarding the distinction between adult use and, and medical cannabis, um, so I understand that um, there is something of a blur between both both kinds of uses, uh, and that there are many people that self-medicate on adult use cannabis. But the thing is. When you are legalizing medical cannabis, you are doing a very specific thing. You are basically telling a lot of companies that they can use a certain substance to produce pharmaceutical products. And this is a very different thing than saying you can smoke weed in your home. These are, these are different issues because on principle, you can uphold the principle that any substance can be used to produce any medicine, right? You, you use a lot of medicines that are extracted, I don't know, from snake poison. People should not use snake poison. There should be no adult use snake poison, but it's still used for medicines. And the same thing goes for cannabis. So that should be a foregone conclusion. So you say, hey, use cannabis for whatever products you need to do. Um, and there shouldn't be a discussion on under which conditions should med Th That's up to doctors, that's up to the experts. Also, the use cases and how it should be used, if it should be smoked or it should be used in other ways, that's a different thing. Now. There are a lot of people that use, that personally use cannabis, uh, I don't know, for spiritual reasons, for to have fun, for reasons that they consider to be medical. But you cannot really um, extend the medical use case to all of those uses. Some people claim, for instance, actually the majority of people claim um, from, um, from a survey in Portugal that they use cannabis to relieve stress uh, or to relieve anxiety or to relieve depression there is really not a lot of evidence that cannabis is positive to alleviate symptoms of depression, or actually not symptoms, maybe they can alleviate the symptoms actually and they can make the problem worse. It's like people who drink to fight depression. You shouldn't drink if you want to fight depression. Now, I'm not taking a medical stance on, on this, right? Because it's not for me, because I'm, I'm a political advisor, it's not for me to decide. It's up to the experts to decide. Um, and so this is why there should be a very well-defined border. Now. If, in a context where adult use is, is legalized, you decide to use cannabis because you feel depressed, that's, that's up to you. But you, it's not like you have the right to a positive medical opinion on this, uh, because that is, that is really what's, uh, what's at stake when you talk about medical cannabis, is under what conditions, 
Can a, um, a medical doctor prescribe cannabis? Do we have RCTs done to uh, uh, verify that the positive effects of these medicines or not? We don't have a study on a lot of, we don't have studies on a lot of use cases. There should be a lot of research done. And I, actually, I think that this brings to another discussion. I think one of the best economic effects that we can get from legalizing cannabis is not even in exporting um, in, in exporting uh, the flour because that's a raw material. Raw materials are an interesting export. They're an interesting goods. There's a lot of money to be done on research, medical research, other kinds of research. Um, there's a lot of foreign direct investment that can employ researchers in Portugal and other countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the way forward. If we can find further use cases for cannabis, that's great. But that's, that's also up to the market then to uh, to decide, up to the experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now. Um, this is just to say, I think there will be different issues, especially politically, and if you mix them, um, you're really setting yourself up to just completely lose the debate. Um, because a lot of people don't use it for medical reasons, and that's fine. There's just different questions. I hope I have answered your question. Hello? Not really. Uh, sorry, man. Because we do have more than three decades of research, man. It's like we're not researching. There is a lot of research all around the world. We have many cases of many countries actually doing something on it, and you can see cases improving today. You could see presentations on this. There's books, lots of books coming out explaining about more of the effects, what the terpenes are, what these phytocannabinoids are, all, all are. And by keep having, I'm sorry, but this view, I think we can be still very limited as professionals to actually develop. Because again, you say it's a political debate. I haven't gone not even close to political. I'm just being like, has we professionals been consulted on this? Have you ever consulted in the university, biologists, biochemists, and so on? Because that is actually the point. Do you understand the culture of cannabis? Do you understand what cannabis is? Do you understand what you just said as like, people having religious beliefs can be medical, but if I'm depressed, well, it's very confusing argument, man, but it's not really the point that we are trying to go, you know. Like, that's washing hands, and the point here is, like, what can we actually do to, man, there is medicals here that have education. They've learned. They know how to read papers. It's not like they cannot research. So what do we have here that we can enable and start and stop e having all this inhibition? Because that's what it is, where it inhibits to actually produce, to m develop to have patients, man, like you say, medics don't prescribe. What will they describe? Prescribe what? One flower for a variety? Mm, that's not much. Like, what else do we have? What options yeah, do we have, well, more or less? Like, question. are we yeah. willing to create those options? Or we need to move to pace? one more question from someone else. Thank you. Yeah, over there. OK, it, this is the last question. So I want to speak to the Portuguese, uh, Jorge Teixeira, please. So uh, today, medical cannabis can, can only be used for a very certain kind of diseases. And I, what I think that my friend here is saying that if, if I want to treat uh, depression, let's say, with cannabis or anxiety with cannabis, which are two conditions that we have plenty of evidence that you can benefit from cannabis. Why not include uh, these conditions into the list of conditions that you can use cannabis medicine, medicinal cannabis for? That, that's, that's the point, I think. Uh, well, the, the point here is simple, is, is that we cannot simply strong harm regulators on, on what are the, the, the acceptable conditions uh, for which you can prescribe cannabis. Now, as I said previously, um, I'm, not, I'm not stating whether cannabis is useful for depression or not. So I've read arguments pro and arguments against. Um, and I don't think it's a job of a politician to decide on whether cannabis is good to treat depressions or not. Um, because, first of all, I'm not qualified to uh, state an opinion on this. Um, I, can, I am qualified to say, I think that regulators and experts should be allowed to decide on whether cannabis should be allowed for, to treat depressions or not. And right now, we have a model in Portugal well, where we have competent authorities that can decide on this, and that is up to them. Now, regarding um, the lack of education in a lot of, a lot of professionals who do not prescribe cannabis because they're still um, too wary of what might happen, 
that really has to do with a lot of work that has to be done in civil society as well. It's not that politicians can push through all of this as well. We can cr create the conditions under which the market for, for medical cannabis is healthier. And so we have uh, better supply, we can create, uh, uh, we can uh, institute co-payments as well like we have for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of medications and so it would be discriminatory to not have co-payments in medical cannabis but there is a lot of work that has to be done on the side of civil society. It's not like we can just talk to Informat and say, hey, you should prescribe this for depression. Still, it's still a valid question in the sense that Portugal is an odd case in Europe in the sense of having a list of prescriptions for which cannabis can be prescribed, right? You don't have that in Germany. In Germany, there are other restrictions if you want that it needs to be prescribed normally as last resort, not as first line of treatment. But there's no list of conditions that doctor can read to say, okay, if you fall into this list, then yes. If not, then go away. Um, same in other European countries, but usually, no country is perfect, each one has its own restrictions. Like if you go to the UK again, if again you don't have a list of, res of, of conditions. In principle, it could be prescribed for anything, but only specialists can prescribe, not general practitioners or family doctors, right? So, um, I mean, I get the frustration of this list of conditions and, and limiting the doctors to only that list. Um, my message is no country is perfect, other countries have other limitations in Europe. Yeah, it so, um, I'm sorry, it's here again. So, of course, I'm not, I'm not asking you to prescribe any med, uh, in, but you as a politician uh, should evoke the, the fact that the, the usage of medical cannabis in Portugal is very shortened by a list of three or four conditions only, and there are many other conditions that can be included into this list to bring uh, like broader benefits on, on conditions that you have already lots of, of documents proving the benefit. That's, that's the only point. So, thanks. We need to finish, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello, J just a quick question on the German demand. Um, you mentioned that's uh, 600 ton for the year to come and 35 ton to be imported. So I'm just trying to understand like where the 550 remaining, like remaining tons are coming from. Is that coming from the German supply? Like are there production sites for 550 ton in Germany? <coughs> you, mean, you mean where that come from? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the question. Uh, uh, so uh, Germany relies on imports, I said uh, earlier. Uh, I prefer that it is uh, that it will be imported into Germany uh, if we create all the necessary preconditions for for that. Um, you would have to set up lots of facilities, huge facilities, lots of investments. We don't have the workforce uh, for setting up these facilities. We don't have the materials right now uh, for to environmental to cost. Sorry. Environmental. Cost? Environmental costs. Uh, uh, they are so energy con consuming. These these facilities, uh, um, and the, uh, they are in the wrong uh, climate conditions. Uh, so that's not an option really for for, for Germany. There will be cultivation, <coughs> but this will be like uh, small experimental uh, um, facilities, like craft cannabis, something like that. But uh, not the, the 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 massive ramp up uh, we we really need. Okay. So basically, the demand is just not met in Germany. Like the 600 ton, it's not met, right? Like that's the total demand, but we cannot meet this demand right now. Uh, you, you mean right now? Or? Yeah. For medical purposes, yes, it is more than met. Oh. No, the 600. I mean, the 600 ton that you're, you're talking about. We cannot meet this demand right now. I mean, the, the yeah, German it is met somehow with uh, CBD flowers from Switzerland oh, okay. uh, coming over Italy, uh, added with uh, synthetic uh, cannabinoids, uh, which make you really, really sick, uh, or with uh, organized crime structures, or with imports from Morocco or Spain or whatever. Of course. Huh, okay, I understand now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then you're answering. <laughs>